circuit preacher the fairest of them all I knew I could never have her but I loved her just the same and I still get that old time feeling when I hear her name photographs and trophy books thing you hold with pride his eyes grow dim won't mean as much as what you've got inside but I've got lots of memories to be worth more than gold and I can say I'm ready Lord anytime it's time to go cause it's been Saddle horse and catch twine That has been my life Some say it's been my downfall For the world has passed me by the Life I live I freely chose I'm at it yet tonight I was born to be a cowboy and I will be till I die. I was born to be a cowboy. And I will be till I die. Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Got myself and the fellow that I'm fixing to introduce to you, and R.J. Vandergriff. What a neat thing that we've got Lyle Lovett and Michael Martin Murphy closing for us. <laughs> See, I don't open for anybody. But I will let Murph and, and Lyle close for us. And so I think that's pretty generous on my part, don't you, Frank? Absent that gum lutely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there's a fella here. If you've been around the Panhandle Plains for any length of time, if you've ever drank a Coors beer, you'll know this fella I'm fixing to announce. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome Ed Montana. Oh, yeah. I'm the one to do it. How is everybody? Man, what a great thank you to Michael and RW and RJ and R. Lyle and R. Ed. It's good to be here for a great cause and see all the smiling faces, all of our friends that are here. And let me see, are we hot here on the old guitar? There we are. Thank you, sir. Oh, that's this one's really hot. Now well, the cowboy way of life. That song that uh, R. W. just finished with. I love that. Roundup in the spring. And lots of great music. Got a new song going to play for you, and it's all about what we're here, the Cowboys. And see what you think of it. We just recorded this one recently, and, and this is being live streamed somewhere. I don't know where it is live streamed. If someone shout it out, then you can call your friends at home and tell them to turn it on and watch it. But here's this new song. Y'all can sing it before we're done. Long live cowboys and what they do. He's an American original, red, white, and blue. He loves the land, God made him, and the craters and the rivers and the wide big skies of blue. Long live cowboys and what they do. Now 
Now you can see him in the saddle in the morning sun Or on the silver screen with his old six gun Riding up just in time to save the day Or he'll be plowing in the field with his old John Deere When the work's all done He'll drink a cold beer then gather with the family round the table come supper time Long live cowboys and what they do He's an American original, red, white, and blue. He loves the land God made him and the craters and the rivers and the white big skies of blue. Long live cowboys and what they do. Here's to the men and women with the band and flu. They got a little cowboy spirit too, like the firemen standing tall face the flames and to the carpenters the doctors the lumberjacks we all know a plumber yeah we've seen that crack that's the cowboy spirit living on today sing it with me now long live cowboys and what they do he's an american original red white and blue he loves the land God made him and the critters and the rivers and the white big skies of blue. Long live cowboys and what they do. Now you can feel it blowing all across our land. It's the cowboy spirit that lives in every man. Long live cowboys and what they do. He's an American original, red, white, and blue. He loves the land God made him and the craters and the rivers and the wide big skies of blue. Long live cowboys and don't forget the cowgirls too. Cause you gotta have cowgirls to make the cowboy do. That's right. Long live Cowboys. Thank you everyone so much. I appreciate that. That'll be out before long. And uh, man, this is just a complete honor to be here, the part of the Panhandle, my home, living right here in the Texas Panhandle. I just love it. Thank you to this man for putting it all together. Thank you, sir. Michael Martin. Ed Montana. Perfect. He was going to introduce the next person, but I want to introduce him. And before I introduce him, I want to tell you that we have Amarillo's Man of the Year here tonight. His name is Tremaine Brown. He has a heart for helping people too, and if you want to find out more about it, his business is called The Vessel. It's a picture of the ark on his business card, The Vessel. And uh, he has a website, and it's beblessedbythevessel.org, correct? Tremaine Brown, thank you for being here. When I did the fire benefit in 2006, a friend of mine who's a cowboy poet, but also a range scientist, deeply trained, worked for the USDA, Natural Resources Service, for many years. He called me up and said, Mike, I've got an idea about how I think we can get a lot of money to the people who were burned out. And I'll let you tell him a little bit more about it, but he has blessed us by being here. He is one of the best known, most knowledgeable rain scientists in the world. He's also just a good old boy. He's a great guy to hang out with. It's Dr. Larry Butler. I should just go backstage and sit down. I can't, I can't top that. I, uh, Appreciate it, Murph. That's that's wonderful. I'm usually on, one on the 
introducing side, not the one being introduced anymore. Uh, I've been retired for 17 years from that job he was talking about. And I've done a lot in between consulting and, and had a TV show called Out on the Land. It was on RFD TV. Some of you may have seen that. It's been on for a while. There's a head shaking. And uh, then, then I wrote a book, a, a story of my life from my childhood all the way up to now, and just full of funny stories. There's nothing academic whatsoever. Um, my guitar doesn't have any strings on it, as you can see. Um, you know, God didn't make everybody in the West to be the cowboy singer, you know. I mean, you had your bartenders. Well, I wasn't lucky enough to be one of them either. But anyway, I have a poem here that you might figure out where I fit. And it's been 25 years since I recited it, and I tried to over in my hotel room or cabin room, and uh, I'd nearly get done and I'd mess it up. So forgive me, but this is my crutch. I don't have a guitar. You know what cowboy singers do whenever they forget the line? They just play a little more chorus. I, I don't have anything to play except fiddle my thumbs. Anyway, here it is. It's called The Cowboy Who Couldn't Sing. We all know the lonesome cowboy out singing to the herd. But there's a cowboy who couldn't sing, a story you've not heard. When he tried to sing the Western songs, he gave his very best, but his melodies just had to be the worst in all the West. He tried to yodel, and he sounded like an old bleeding goat. Oh, Cookie tried to help him. Yeah, he gave him something for his throat. Well, once he sang to his sweetheart, and she ran off with a stranger. He almost quit punching cows to become a Texas Ranger. When he went to church, he sat up close on the very first pew. But when he sang, all the folks left, well, except for a faithful few. He once sang over a coffin where a feller puncher lied, but it was so bad the crowd quit mourning, and they liked to laugh till they died. <laughs> well, around the flickering campfire, his song was far from the best. Folks would leave so fast, he actually started the first ghost town in the West. His raspy voice cracked more than an old worn-out weathered saddle. T'was so bad spurs didn't jingle and rattlers wouldn't rattle. A longhorn herd often got restless when he sang to his steed. Why, his night herd and song had even been known to cause the stampede. He, loved, he truly loved the western songs because it gave him a lift. He really wished he could sing, but God didn't give him the gift. He couldn't sing a tune because the cowboys would leave every time, but he couldn't quit the words because he truly did love to rhyme. Where's that old cowboy today? Well, I think you all know it. He's standing here in Amarillo town. He thinks he's a cowboy poet. <laughs> Now it's uh, my great pleasure to bring out a congressman, Dr. Ronnie Jackson, from here. He was raised in Level End, Texas. He learned the value of family farm, family faith, and hard work on the farm. After working as a roustabout in the West Texas oil field, he paid his way through undergraduate school at Texas A&M. Following graduation from medical school at the University of Texas Medical Branch, he began active duty in the United States Navy. With unique training in undersea medicine, I didn't even know that was an elective or an option, but it must be. He, he utilized his talents while assigned to locations ranging from Panama City, Florida, to Sigonella, Italy. Somewhere in Italy, I bet it's close to the water. <laughs> well, Dr. Jackson would later, and I don't mean to be making jokes, I just, I never heard of that, so I didn't know. No. Dr. Jackson would later compete, complete his residency in emergency medicine, finishing the top of his class. That's what you'd expect from a guy from Texas, top of his class. Soon thereafter, he deployed to Iraq to lead resuscitative medicine efforts on the battlefield for a combat surgical shock trauma platoon. While serving in Iraq, he was called back to the States to serve in the White House Medical Unit 
during President George W. Bush's administration. Dr. Jackson ultimately led the White House Medical Unit as director of the White House Medical Unit and as physician to the president during the Obama administration. And in December 2014, he ended his duties as director and continued being physician to the president. He was also physician to the president under the Trump administration. And in January 2019, President Donald Trump appointed him as chief medical advisor and assistant to the president. In December of 19, after 25 years of distinguished service in his country, Dr. Jackson, to his country, Dr. Jackson retired from the United States Navy as a rear admiral. He returned to the state, great state of Texas and ran for Congress. He was elected to serve the Texas 13th Congressional District in November of 2020. He has many committee assignments, including Agriculture, our House Armed Services Committee, House Foreign, Service, uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, and the House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic. Dr. Jackson is happily married to his wife of 30 years, Jane. The couple has three children. Their oldest, Libby, holds an MBA from Mount St. Mary's University and works in national security. Her, their middle child, Ben, is a Navy officer and proud graduate of the United States Naval Academy. Their youngest, Matthew, is a sophomore at West Texas A&M University, right over here. Well, folks, uh, I wish every congressman in our nation had that kind of resume. Always tops, always willing to serve and, and being well rewarded for it with uh, being a rear admiral. But I gotta ask him this. I bet he won't answer it. I hope he don't. And I don't mean any disrespect, Congressman. But I thought a rear admiral worked for something besides under the sea. <laughs> Come on out, Congressman. I, I wouldn't have, yeah, I'm about to. I wouldn't have said that, but we've already met backstage, and he knows I'm kind of a clown anyway. But uh, I highly respect you, Congressman Ronnie Jackson, from right here in this district. Thank you, Congressman. For all Thank you, Larry. Life. Appreciate it. Well, th thank you, Larry, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, you're right, I will tell you that when I, when I first got selected as Rear Admiral, which is a one-star, you know, it's the same as a Brigadier General and, the, and some, for some of you that don't know the Navy lingo. But when I got selected, one of the first persons, one of the first people that called me was President Bush. He called me up and he's like, congratulations on your promotion and everything. He said, uh, uh, really excited that uh, you're going to be uh, a Rear Admiral. And he goes, you keep working hard and someday you're going to get the upper half. Uh, you know, you're going to be, the, you know, not you. And, and uh, I told him, I said, well, it's even worse than that because in the Navy there's two types of rear admirals. It's the same as a brigadier general uh, and a major general and it's a rear admiral uh, upper half and the rear admiral lower half. So I had to tell him, I said, it's even worse than it sounds, sir. It's not just a rear admiral, it's a rear admiral lower half, right? So, uh, but anyways, uh, no, it's an honor to be here. Thank you guys for, uh, for allowing me to come up and just say hi. I, uh, I, the, the unfortunate thing is, uh, unfortunately, I have no uh, musical talents whatsoever. I uh, tried one of these, I tried to get these guys to give me a guitar back here, and none of them would give their, give their guitar to me. So uh, I, I don't have anything to offer on that front, but I just want to say thank you to everybody for being here. Uh, thank you to... Uh, uh, to Michael Martin Murphy and Lyle Lovett and all of these talented celebrities and performers that have uh, that, are that are playing here and, and entertaining us tonight for their time, uh, which is extremely valuable, and to donate it to a cause like this. I, I'll tell you, I've uh, been the congressman for the 13th Congressional District now, which is the Panhandle of Texas, and all of North Texas, about three counties deep, all the way down along the Red River uh, to up above the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And I, I, I know a lot of folks here are from, from all over the state. And I, I'll just tell you, nothing makes you prouder uh, to be the congressman from the 13th Congressional District than to see what happened in the aftermath of this fire. And, uh, you know, I, I, we went up there. I, ju I just happened to be in town, thank goodness. And we were actually supposed to be in session in Congress the next day. And, uh, and we, we got a pretty slim majority right now. We have a two or three seat uh, majority. We got a one seat now, but at the time we had a co just a two seat majority. And they were saying, you know, we need to get you back here right away. Uh, we got votes coming up. 
And I told him, I said, look, it would be complete malpractice if I left my district in a time like this. And so, you know, my district director, Christy Morrow, who's over here with me, we got in the truck and we went up and we went up, spent the whole day in Canadian, went to Fritch and went to Borger and we just went all over the place. We spent two or three days up there driving around, looking at the damage. And I'll tell you, what, you know, the reason I say nothing makes you prouder than to be the congressman from this particular area of Texas is because I've traveled all over the world. I've traveled to, uh, you know, 100 and 130 plus countries and I've traveled all over the United States and I was at the White House as, as mentioned for about 14 years during three administrations Bush, Obama and Trump and oftentimes when there's a big disaster the president will get in uh, get on the Air Force One and he'll fly to an area and sometimes I'll go out a, a day ahead of him and, and just check things out and then I'll come back and I'll go out with him on the plane and, uh, and we'll talk to folks, and, and I, I promise you, I have never been, and I, this is sincere, out of everywhere I've been, and I've been to lots of places where there's been fires and tornadoes and hurricanes and everything you can imagine, I have never seen a population, a group of people come together as strong as the people in the 13th Congressional District, for people to treat complete strangers like their family and like their neighbors and, and to drop everything they're doing to help them uh, and give everything they have to help them get back on their feet. It's inspiring. And it makes me proud to be your congressman. So I want to thank you first and foremost for that. You guys are, an fam are a fabulous team and a fabulous family. And, 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 uh, and, and we're going to do great things here. We've been doing everything we can to make sure that we uh, help recover from this from the federal uh, level. We've had got lots of uh, great uh, state uh, politicians that are involved in this as well, as well, of course, as all of our uh, our county and, 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 and city officials that have been involved in this. Of course, we had 1.4 million acres that were burned, I think 4,000 miles of fence. We had uh, 7, 000, over 7,500 head of cattle that were uh, that were injured. You know, when we first got here, the, the, the very first day that we went up there, right at the, the morning, the morning after the fires, the fires were burning that night, and then that morning we got up and we went to Canadian, and I got in a helicopter with Jason Abraham, and he flew me all over the area. And, you know, we flew from, from uh, Jason's place up uh, in and around Canadian, and I was just astonished at what I saw. I mean, everything was burned. I mean, everything was just black. And uh, the, the sad part is there were cattle all over the place, and a lot of them were lined up in a row because they'd made it as far as the fence, and they'd stopped, and then they'd, 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 they'd fallen down and burned there. S the sad part is some of them weren't dead. They were, they were writhing around, you know, couldn't get up. Uh, it, was, it was just a horrible thing to see. But, you know, when we got in closer to Canadian, I saw the same thing when I went to Fritch and other places. Uh, I saw places where uh, homes were just burned to the ground. I mean, and there was literally nothing there but maybe a little uh, stone wall that had surrounded the outer uh, the outer perimeter of the property and you could see that they'd lost their homes they'd lost their vehicles their vehicles were burned they'd lost their animals a lot of them a lot of these folks don't have insurance obviously right i mean times are hard right now the economy uh, is not good and and a lot of folks have to make decisions about whether they're going to buy insurance or put food on the table and so it, it's it, it's a, it's a it's a bad situation for a lot of folks uh, hundreds of homes were lost and i think that it's just a great thing that everybody's getting together tonight to try to help we're going to continue to fight and do everything we can from the federal level to make sure we, we get this taken care of, whether it's FEMA or the Small Business Administration or the USDA. Anytime we can squeeze a dollar out of the federal government to come back here to the panhandle and take care of our farmers and our ranchers and the folks that live in our urban or in our uh, rural communities here uh, all throughout the panhandle in North Texas, we are going to fight for every penny that we can get here because these are honestly uh, the, the best folks in the country. And you know, I, I'm not going to get too political up here. Here. This is not a political event at all, but you know, obviously, I'm, I'm the Republican. I'm the Republican representative from the number one most conservative district in the entire United States. So I, I have a tendency to to get a little partisan every now and then. But look, I'm going to tell you that. The reason this country is still surviving right now, despite a lot of the nonsense that's going on right now, is because of people like the ones that are, that are right here in this room tonight, right here in this in this area tonight. Uh, because the panhandle of Texas, North Texas, uh, some of the areas just south of us, West Texas in general, we're not only what keeps Texas red, but we're what keeps this country United States of America. And so I thank you guys for all that you do. I thank you for the supporting me. Uh, I'm going to continue to fight hard to represent you. We're going to continue to fight hard to make sure that we uh, th that we can take care of these folks that, that have had such a, an incredible loss uh, to, to their uh, to their livelihood. And, and some of them, you know, we, we had some actual people that lost their lives in this fire as well. So uh, God bless you all. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you for having me.
if you go to the congressman's website, uh, jackson.house.gov, you can find all the information about where you can get assistance or if you have friends or family that are from the burned area and they've lost a lot, tell them to go there. Uh, it's, I printed it off, it's, it's pretty uh, extensive. And then my former agency is the Natural Resource Conservation Service and they're housed at the Ag Service Centers in each county and the Farm Services Agency is there with them too. They have programs for uh, assistance and disaster and then also some cost share programs to help pay for some things. So anyway, with that, I thank the Congressman and everybody that's played so far and we're in for a real treat coming up really soon. But right now, we're gonna take a break. So pay attention and we'll know when to come back.
Okay, this is a guitar uh, that Michael Mark, uh, Murph brought out, and it has the lyrics all the way around it uh, of Wildfire, just so y'all know. Really cool piece. And so we're going to start it off right here. Give me a thousand. I'm going to thousand to buy a thousand to bear. I'm going to thousand. I'm going to twelve hundred. I'm going to fourteen. I'm going to fourteen. I'm going to sixteen hundred. I'm going to eighteen hundred. Eighteen. I'm going to two. I'm going to two to buy a two to bear in the back right there. Nine. I'm going to two thousand. I'm going to get a get a get a two thousand. I'm going to eighteen hundred right here. Nineteen. One time. Eighteen. Eighteen hundred. Now I'm going to nineteen. Now I'm going to nineteen hundred. Anybody else? I'm going to nineteen hundred. I'm going to get a get a got him in the front right here at eighteen. Need nineteen. Nineteen. Now I'm going to two thousand. I'm going to two to buy a two to bear. I'm going to get a get a get a you're out right here and need two thousand. I'm going to get a get a nineteen hundred. Now I'm going to two. Nineteen. Nineteen hundred, number two thousand. Nothing to get to get to congressman. Number nineteen hundred, number two. I'm gonna two to buy a two to buy. Nothing to get to get to get nineteen hundred. Number two, number twenty one hundred. I'm gonna get to get to get to get two thousand. Number twenty one, two thousand. Number twenty one hundred. I'm gonna get to get to get to get two thousand. Number twenty one hundred. I'm gonna get to two thousand. Number twenty one, two thousand. Number twenty one hundred, two thousand. Number twenty one, twenty one hundred. I'm gonna sell it. Almost sell it right here. I got it right here. You never back out at a charity event. I'm going to 2100 right here. Number two. I'm going to 2200. I'm going to 2200. Nobody's going to mind, are they? I'm going to 21. Number two to you. I'm going to 2200. Number 23. I'm going to 2300. Number four. I'm going to 23. Four to buy. Four to bear. I'm going to 24. Number 500. I'm going to 5. Number 600. I'm going to 25. Number 6 to buy. 6 to bear. I'm going to 2500. Number 2600. 25. Number 6. 6 to you. I'm going to 25. Number 600. I'm going to 2500. Number 2600. 2600. One time, it's two hundred more dollars, sir. Won't regret it. Twenty-five hundred number to twenty-six hundred. Twenty-six hundred. Twenty-five number to six hundred. Sold it right here. Twenty-five hundred dollars. There you have it. Thank you, folks. Vince Nowak is the buyer. Thank you, Vince. We appreciate that. All right, you guys. Yep, that's me, Tom Schooler. Uh, Y'all have a good evening. Thank you. Those of you who weren't here earlier, neither one of us needs any introduction because we're trying to erase a good part of our past. <laughs> and believe me, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Temperature is dropping a little bit, so I'll get right into it. I'm going to have to stop and tune once in a while because of that.
I said, well, this is going to be about the Midwest. And they said, no, it's not going to be about the Midwest. And they gave me information. Every single state has a heartland. And in that heartland are people who grow the food for the people who live in the big cities. And they are the true heart of the nation. They're the, they're the backbone of everything. Rain scientist and ecologist Alan Savory once said, when agriculture fails, civilization fails. You have, it is the backbone of civilization, agriculture. So I wrote this song for my grandparents who were just humble East Texas ranchers and farmers. Way before the sun comes up Already on his second cup He's looking out across the open sky Streaks of orange, pink and gray Wash over rows of new mown hay The rangeland fills a cowboy's heart and pride He rises slowly from his chair his back is stiff, graze in his hair. Spend a lot of long days in the sun. He ain't one much to complain. He saddles up and takes the reins and rides hard till his working day is done. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man. Who spent their whole lives living close to the land. There's a love for this country, there's a pride in the brand, in America's heartland, living close, close to the land. Close to the land. When the sun is high overhead She's been eight hours out of bed She's still got a lot of work to do Pulling weeds and patching jeans And keeping faith when times are lean She does a man's work and a woman's too She'll run the tractor, water stock Fix the truck, then feed her flock. But somehow, she still gets roses from the ground. She ain't one much to complain. She saddles up and takes the reins and rides hard till her working day is done. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man spent their whole lives living close to the land there's a love for the country there's a pride in the brand in America's heartland living close to the land Something that the people know Who make things live and Make things grow Deeper than the words Of any sage That unless you've Touched the earth Planted seeds or given birth The human heart Can never come of age You can see it In the eyes of every Woman and man who spent their whole lives living close to the land. There's a love for the country, there's a pride in the brand in America's heartland, living close to the land. 
in America's heartland, close to the land, Texas heartland, close to the land, Oklahoma heartland, close to the land, Wisconsin heartland, close to the land, even Illinois. Close to the land, California heartland, close to the land. Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free, tis a gift to come down where we ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right it will be in the valley of love and delight and when true simplicity is gained to bow and to bend we won't be ashamed to turn turn will be our delight Till by turning, turning, we come around right. Bringing in the sheaves. Good Lord, we're bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing. She Thank you so much. I went first because I want to introduce him. This, uh, I met this guy when he interviewed me. He was a, a reporter for the Texas A&M newspaper, right? That's right, the battalion. The Battalion, and he is a graduate of Texas A&M, by the way. He's also a fine horseman, and in his spare time, he writes songs. Uh, he's done a lot for the AQHA right here in Amarillo by just being a celebrity that was willing to go out and compete in reining contests on his horses. He comes from a ranching background, and I think that's in part why he's here tonight. Lyle Lovett. Thank you, Murph, and thank you all for including me. When Murph called me a few weeks ago and, and told me what he was up to, that he wanted to do something uh, for the folks up here uh, who, who suffered through the fires, uh, it, it, was, uh, well, it was easy for me uh, to, to join in. Uh, I, my grandfather was a, was a farmer. His father was a farmer. His father was a farmer. Uh, we, we still live on on what was my grandpa's farm place in North Harris County in the Houston area. Uh, I've worked my whole life just to be able to keep the, the place together. Uh, my, my mom's younger brother has a, a small cow-calf operation that, that uh, he runs on the place, and uh, we make hay, and it is just uh, the best feeling to, to stand under an oak tree that I used to stand under with my grandpa. Uh, just connects all the dots in my entire life. Michael Martin Murphy uh, is one of my heroes, and I, uh, you know, uh, it is such a privilege to get to know one of your heroes. Uh, I was so excited to get to interview Murph when I was a journalism student at Texas A&M, and, and uh, he was so gracious. He, he had come to A&M a couple of years before I met him uh, when his song Wildfire was the biggest song on the radio. I'd, I'd read about Murph, I'd read about the the musicians who played, the singer-songwriters who played the Rubiot in Dallas and would come down to Houston and play Liberty Hall. And when I had a chance to go see Murph at G. Raleigh White Coliseum, I did not hesitate. Uh, Murph was a big pop star. And for the first hour of his show to a packed G. Raleigh White Coliseum, he came out with his guitar, 
just him without his band, and he captivated the entire Coliseum of Aggies, who occasionally did whoop, and it didn't throw Murph at all. <laughs> but he, he, he could have done the entire show uh, just, just like that, just by himself. And as I watched Murph, and I listened to his brilliant thumb create the rhythm of an entire band, I thought, well, that's how you do it. That must be how you do it. Murph, you're an inspiration to me. That's a little too rock and roll for me. Mm -hmm. I think we got it. This is, this is a song that, that uh, Murph played that night, uh, and, and it was the first time I had heard it, and he hadn't recorded it uh, at, at that point. He was nice enough to let me record it on a record I did back in 1998. Uh, Murph, will you help me out with this? I still haven't recorded it because you did it better than <laughs> I could ever hope to do. <laughs> I was driving down a West Texas highway I seen a hitchhiker with his thumb pointing my way. It didn't look suspicious. It didn't look any too clean. So I put on my brakes and I opened up the door. You could tell it was a bum by the, the boots that he wore. He said, I'm going down to Haskell. Got a woman down in Evelyn. He told me, son, but East Texas is where I come from. I've been riding that Jacksonville rodeo and I got humdrum. I'm traveling around a whole lot of Texas I've seen. Yes, and I, I'm mighty glad you was, was pushing out my way in your fancy clothes and this big Chevrolet. He said, I'm going down to Haskell, got a woman down in Evelyn. Grinning like a possum, a mighty happy rascal. He waved goodbye when I let him out at Haskell. And that's about the last of that old tramp that I've ever seen. But you know that I'm still wishing to, to this very day he had my clothes in this big Chevrolet and it was me going to high school with a woman down in an airplane I'm still wishing to this very day he had my clothes and my big Chevrolet and it was me going to high school with a woman Michael Martin Murphy.
that's that you know the, that's all you need that song right there that's <laughs> all you need that's it explains life it explains all of our motivation it had the you know when I, as i listen to your chord changes and your you know your your knowledge of the blues and then listen to the way the way you played with words you know the the words you chose to rhyme haskell and rascal <laughs> it just wants it just just makes you want more of that of all of that. Well, uh, appreciate it, man. Thank you. So we're here tonight because of what's up ahead of us. It's unseen. So sometimes completely changes our lives. It's not always a bad thing, and uh, all I have to say is we're burned, but we're not burned out, right? We're not burned out. I had a lot of twists and turns happen in my life, in my career. My favorite artist, the Southwest, has a museum in Santa Fe. Her name is Georgia O'Keeffe. This song was inspired by not only a painting that she did, but something that she said once. She said, the secret to being a successful artist is making your unknown known. In other words, instead of talking about how much you know, talk just as much about what you don't know, and maybe a little bit more about what you don't know. And she also said, make your unknown known, and then Always keep the unknown just a little bit up ahead of you and around the, the bend. This is called The Road Beyond the View. I wrote it with my son Ryan. Flowers in the nursery, ram's head floating by, dead roses for Anita, floating mountains in the sky, one for Arthur and Lavender, a nursery of bones, petals in the desert, a pallet of stones, apples from a broken tree. Skulls in the clouds, green simplicity, unspoken doubts, underlying purple chaos, screaming red from above, antlers from eternity, dead letters broken love, the road beyond the view, far away nearby. Chase the red clay moon into the wild-eyed night. Tonight I'm coming home again from a place I never knew. Black mesa and a dark wind on the road beyond the view. Black mesa and a dark wind on the road beyond the view. Tonight I'm looking for another place On the road beyond the view You know I thought I saw your face Far away and close to you In a canvas hidden turquoise A blue lark spur In the spaces of emptiness I hear the messenger I want to live beyond politics Red and blue religion too. Walk the desert playing pickup sticks, solving riddles false and true. Cross of Jesus in the sunset, bleeding heart wasteland. In the cliffs beyond Abiquiu, in a sea of sage and sand, 
road beyond the view, far away and nearby, chase the red clay moon to the wild eyed night. Tonight I'm coming home again, face I never knew. Black Mesa and a dark wind on the road beyond the view. Black Mesa and a dark wind on the road beyond the view. of getting to know Ryan. I, I met Ryan when you were doing that wonderful show you did with the Bruce Wood Dance Company. And, and uh, gosh, Ryan is such a great musician and, and, and teaches high school in, in Nashville, doesn't he? Yeah, teaches at the Nashville's, Nashville School of the Arts, yes. which is a magnet school for all the weirdos in Nashville <laughs> to assemble and go to high school. <laughs> And he loves it. <laughs> well, he's, he is, and, and you wrote that, y'all wrote that song together. Yeah. How wonderful. How wonderful. How, how does, in, in your early career, you co-wrote in that sort of music biz way with, with, uh, with lo lots of brilliant folks. Uh, songs you wrote with Charles John Corto, who I had met uh, when I first went to Nashville. How how did those co-writes differ from writing with your own son? Well, the whole album, Word Beyond the View, is about our experience of being Texans, but going to New Mexico and even living, I lived in New Mexico for a long time. Never gave up my Texas residency, though. I wrote down my, sorry, I admit this now, I confess this. I, uh... I kept my parents as my residency in Texas, no matter where I went. My other place was always a second home. But uh, New Mexico is probably the strangest, weirdest place. You know, people talk a lot about inclusion these days. They got that done 500 years ago in New Mexico. Every strange, it's a great place for songwriters because of all the uh, characters that live there. So my son was raised in the summertime in New Mexico when I lived in Taos, and uh, he fell in love with it. And when we decided to write a, an album together, he said, let's, let's make this whole album about the adventure of spending some time in New Mexico. So that's why it differed, is that we shared this deep common bond of having had the same experiences that I can't say that I shared with any other person I co-wrote with. I mean, a lot of people have a lot in common with, but you can't have anything more in common with than your son. And uh, it's also different because he knows a whole lot more guitar chords than I do, <laughs> and he's a better guitar teacher, so I got guitar lessons in the, in the, that was another cool thing. There's nine songs on the album, and I can only play five of them. <laughs> I can sing all of them, but I can only play five on the guitar. It's a jazz album. <laughs> well, I can't imagine anything better than, than uh, writing a song uh, with, with my son. I, uh, the, uh, I have made up, I have, uh, my wife April and I have six-year-old twins. I got a late start, my first children uh, ever. And, and uh, I had no idea absolutely no idea what I was missing and I'm so glad because I would have uh, you know I would have been miserable if I'd realized uh, my friends all told me uh, were kind of teasing me uh, that boy is your life going to change like that and and uh, and I would say no 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 it's not but of course it does change but what they didn't tell me was that it doesn't change in a single way that you don't want it to uh, the uh, we we make up little rhymes and songs all the time. Uh, uh, I hope one day I, I'll get to record one that I wrote with him. Uh, our, we're, our, our current hit around the house is one uh, that they, the title they thought of called It's a Naked Party. <laughs> I 
thinking about New Mexico, you know, it really is a special place. And, and uh, uh, I, th I think about it. being involved with uh, raining horses and rain cow horses, going to all those years, going to Nevada for uh, the Snapple bit you shared before they moved it to Fort Worth, thinking about those uh, great horse trainers uh, uh, like Todd Crawford, who was out in California, then moved to Oklahoma, and would go, it would, it would take the same horse to the Snapple Bit Futurity and then turn right around and go back to Oklahoma City and, and uh, show in the reigning Futurity. Uh, that's that's kind of where this one came from. <laughs> That's a cowboy song right there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we don't do this for ourselves. I don't do this for me. I'm sure Lyle agrees. We do this for you. So what do you want to hear? So here's how I came to write this song. I was uh, working on a project in LA for Kenny Rogers. 
back in that time, there were these albums coming out. They were double albums, and they called them concept albums. And they were, they did what albums just don't do anymore. In fact, there are no albums. It's everything individually streamed now. They were songs that were all interrelated, that told a certain story, like uh, the uh, original Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat, Jesus Christ Superstar. They started off as album concepts before they turned them into stage plays. So Kenny Rogers called me and he said, I, I want to do, uh, I heard you and Larry Chancellor, that's the guy I wrote songs with, who I wrote this song with, we're, 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 are working on a, a little concept album about a ghost town in California called Calico. Calico came to fascinate me. I lived in the San Bernardino Mountains there. There was no music business in Texas then. Had to go to LA to get a songwriting job and play the clubs in order to survive. But I decided I'd do that, by, survive by living up in the mountains above the smog. I'd drive down into the desert and I would visit this little ghost town. There was an old miner there named Calico Cal. And uh, I spent lots of days with him. And he told me what it was like to be associated with a boom town. So we completed that project in about three months, pretty much staying up all night long every day because there was a deadline on it. And uh, I've always believed that my role was to talk about my own neighborhood and my own backyard. That's why I like why I love it. You know, my favorite writers, Gabriel Garcia Marquez wrote 100 Years of Solitude, Love in the Time of Cholera, which could teach you a lot about what we went through in COVID, it wasn't unique, you know. Uh, he wrote about his own backyard, but somehow when you read his own backyard and just about his culture and the details of his culture, somehow it becomes universal because you can identify that people go through the same things no matter who they are and what they do. So we completed this project. While we were writing it, I started having dreams about how much I wanted to get back to Texas. And I want to get back to my roots. And not just Texas, but the whole West and the American Midwest which Texas is technically really a Midwestern state, not a far Western state. I started having dreams and I, I dreamed about a horse that was coming across the prairie with a beautiful woman riding on the horse. And I wrote down all the images that I had in my mind. And I had a, I had a, a legal pad, I used to keep a legal pad to write down my dreams because I found that my dreams took me further as a songwriter than what I thought about when I was waking. And may I say to every person in there who enjoys creativity or aspires to creativity, listen to your dreams. In the book of Exodus, Joseph says to prisoners who are thrown in the same prisoner with him, that dreams are God's business. Dreams are God's business. I don't understand this song. I have no idea what it means. Just like Georgia O'Keeffe, it's best to just make your unknown known and I don't know what this song means either. Maybe that's why it's lasted so long. People keep arguing about it. I do think it means something about freedom. If I could pick one thing that I love more than my faith, my Christianity, my faith, it would be freedom. And I love my faith because it is a religion of freedom. You're free to choose who you want to be and what you want to be and if you're going to follow the code or if you're not, you are free to make that decision.
She comes down from Yellow Mountain On a dark flatland she rides On a pony she named Wildfire A whirlwind by your side On a cold Nebraska night They say she died one winter When there came a killing frost And the pony she named Wildfire Busted down a stall In a blizzard he was lost Calling wildfire, calling wildfire, calling So by the dark of the moon I planted But there came an early snow In a hoot owl howling outside my window now Six nights in a row Coming for me No one knew the name of the writer until he chose to reveal it. He had an iron rod of flame coming out of his mouth because he came to bring truth and judgment. And then it was revealed that the name of the writer is the Word of God. Thank you. Thank God for sending me a dream. You sent me a dream. So I have another dream, and that is that uh, 
that we'll get some money for the people who have, who have lost everything and are still out there insisting that they're going to tough it out. Let's have a hand with that young cowboy And wish him better luck next time And hope we see him up in Argo Or somewhere further down the line But this time he should do a bad one One that nobody could ride by the way he put his hat on, you knew he'd be there for the fight. And it's the classic contradiction, it's the unavoidable affliction. But it don't take much to predict, son, the way it always goes. Cause one day she'll say she's ushered And the next she'll say die And push will always come to shove you On that midnight rodeo Somehow he gave up in the end. They put one hand around the other and let that big up man on in. And you know, it was his last chance to ride. Now he'll have to move along. But way back in his mind, he knows he won't be gone for long. And it's the classic gun station. It's the unavoidable affliction. But it don't take much to predict so. the way it always goes. Because one day. I tell you, made me nervous. <laughs> I was worried about his whole career, really. <laughs> He'd been doing so well up to that point, and then he... Well, partner, uh, you want to request something? Well, I have many requests, Murph. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the... Um, We've got till it gets too cold, so I think we're, we're getting there pretty fast. But. Do you, you know, and and this is one that I, I think it would thematically is, you know, it's, you talk, so, well, your faith, the way you talk about your faith, the way you share your faith without telling people what to do, without any judgment whatsoever, uh, is inspiring and uplifting to all of us who believe. And... Well, we we appreciate that. Well, uh, I am a witness, not a judge. There you go. Amen. Amen. The, the the song you wrote that uh, that you said was inspired by Saint Francis. 
is one that I love and one that I, one that I, you know, learned how to play guitar playing. Would you be willing to play that one? Yes, sir. If I can get my hands warmed up enough to. <laughs> So my brother was a Baptist, and I'm a Baptist still. He went to Baylor University, though. I didn't make it there. I went to North Texas and then went to UCLA. When I got out there and lived that life, I came to realize that my parents raised me right. But I didn't have anything to compare it to until I got out there. This is one of my older songs. My brother gave me a book about the life of St. Francis when I was in my early 20s. It's G.K. Chesterton's book. He's a great Catholic theologian about St. Francis. So some of the lines come from the lines that are in that book. Imagine a man over 800 years ago standing up to the church saying, you know, you don't need anybody between you and God. That almost got him killed. He took off all of his clothes in the middle of the little town square of Assisi, walked off into the woods with nothing but a sack like a feed sack on with a rope tied around it and some sandals, and that's all he had. Came from a rich family. He left it all behind. Said he wanted to see if he could find more faith out there in the wilderness. He ended up writing prayers to the sun, to the birds, to the trees. All the people in Rome thought he was crazy. Maybe he was a little bit crazy. Because he called the forest brother. Because he called the earth his mother, they drove him out into the rain. Some people even said that the boy from the country was insane. Because he spoke with fish in the creek. He tried to tell us. That the animals can speak And who knows Maybe they do Hey, how do you know they don't Just because they've never spoken to you Boy from the country left his home when he was young. Boy from the country, 
He loves his son. He tried to tell us that we should love the land. We just turned our heads and laughed. You see, we did not understand. But you know, sometimes I think the boy from the country must be the only one who sees. Cause a boy from the country doesn't want to see the forest he'd rather see the trees boy from the country left his home when he was young Boy from the country, he loves the sun. So country roads take me home to the place I belong. So I'm glad. When this life is over, I'll fly away. When John died, hallelujah by and by, John just flew away. I think uh, you know what I'm referring to. Uh, I, I didn't make that song a hit. I put it on my first album, but uh, I wrote it a long time before that. John Denver recorded that song. If it hadn't been for him, I wouldn't be sitting here tonight. It was the first time I really got a decent paycheck for writing a song. You know, I owe it all to John Denver. What an amazing guy he was. And when John died, I noticed one of the people that got interviewed was... Why well, I love it, and how much an admirer of John that he was. He, he, John, you know, John was uh, so kind to me. I I met him just from playing up uh, in Aspen, you know, close to where he lived, and he would he would come to come to shows, and he would, uh, you know, he'd occasionally walk out on stage and, and sing a harmony, and uh, you know, I tell you that was a, just a thrill, a thrill. Uh, <laughs> This is this is a, a song you mentioned uh, yesterday when we were uh, talking. That um, where where where? Let's see. I think right here. And this is this is one this is one that I got to sing with John that he that he knew from his days in the uh, Chad Mitchell Trio. Turn up my heater a little bit. Right? <laughs> <laughs> now, is there any truth to the rumor, Murph? I, I was taught once in geography class, may have been seventh grade Texas history, in fact, that uh, that there's just a chance that the Red River and the Brazos River were misnamed. They were, their names were swapped. 
Is, is there, uh, is there, do you think there's any, or is that just tabloid hearsay? That is true, and I'm not, but I'm not sure, of the re I can't remember why, but uh, the Red River, the song Red River Valley was written about, was not written about the Red River here, along here, it was written about the Red River in Canada. And uh, so uh, I think it got named the Red River though because of the redness of the clay and the dirt, you know, we talk about red dirt music. Uh, there some yeah, that is the river of red dirt music for <laughs> sure. That's right. Well, they, it was explained to us that the, the Brazos de Dios, the arm of God, uh, might have swooped across the top of that part of North Texas. This is, this is a... Amen, brother. <laughs> We crossed the wild bays, we boarded the new oasis, we swung the Guadalupe and we followed the brasses. Red River runs rusty, the witch is dog clear, but down by the brasses I courted my dear, singing la la. So when your wife shows up, you better do her request, right? <laughs> 
So my wife is the chief of the Apalachicola Creek Indians Blunt Band of Texas. They came, they came from Florida to a Texas in the 1830s. When they got to New Orleans, they got off of a steamship and they were arrested for being Indians. That was the reason that was their crime, they were Indians. And then they proceeded to walk in canoe their way all the way to where the Brazos comes out, down by Houston, right? Trinity, I'm sorry. And they canoed all the way up the Trinity to about where Livingston, Texas is now. And uh, when the big dams came in, uh, their villages were completely wiped out. But there's a little cabin that stands there to their memory. And uh, so I did the case to Cindy tonight because like all Native Americans, they deserve to get their rights to their land back. I'm happy to see that today, through a Supreme Court decision, that one-fourth of Oklahoma now is actually governed by the Cherokees, the Creeks, and the Muscogees. And uh, there's other Supreme Court decisions that are coming down, which I feel once we get all that settled with all the Native Americans, we broke over 150 treaties. Only one has been kept. And now we're going through the rest of them. When we get to the point where we've honored all those treaties, that's when we'll be a great nation at that time. I think a great nation keeps its word. I wrote this as a protest song. I have no Native American blood in me. But I do come from the most tribal people on earth, known as the Irish people. We don't much like it when you run us off our land either. Whoa, boys, take me back. I want to ride in Chirumbo's Cadillac. Take me back. I want to ride in the Cadillac. Let me ride. Take me back. I want to ride in Chirumbo's Cadillac. Let me ride.
ripped off the feathers from his uniform. Jesus, tell me, and I believe it's true. Red is the color in the sunset, too. Ripped off his land, won't give it back. Sent Geronimo a Cadillac. I say, whoa, boys, take me back. I want to ride in Geronimo's Cadillac. Whoa, boys, take me back. I want to ride in Geronimo's Cadillac. Let me It's the only person you want to make sure you get a standing ovation from. <laughs> yes, it is. I was thrilled to meet Congressman uh, Jackson, Dr. Jackson. Uh, my dad was in the Navy, and was uh, uh, joined the Navy when he was 17, uh, came from a kind of a difficult home situation, and joined the Navy to, to get away from, from home. And uh, You know, that was underage at that time. My uncle did the same thing. I'll be. He was 17 when he hit Omaha Beach. Oh, man. Can you imagine? But I, I love to hear my dad tell stories about his days in the Navy. He, he, did, he did four years. And uh, he, was, he served on a cargo ship called the USS Yancey uh, during the Korean War and, and uh, went back and forth between uh, San Francisco and Sasebo, Japan. But he would stay for weeks at a time in uh, Sasebo uh, because he was on the Navy boxing team. He fought as a middleweight. And uh, uh, he was, I never messed with my dad at all. <laughs> we always had boxing gloves, but I knew better than to put them on. Uh, uh, I loved to, when I was a little boy, when he'd be at work, I'd, uh, I'd open up my parents' closet, and he, uh, he always had his dress blues hanging next to his, um, his work suits, and I used to feel the texture and, and run my finger over the insignias, and I'd look in a little box that he had at his medals, and uh, I just always thought, you know, that's... You know, a grown-up man, a real man, uh, is in the Navy. And, and uh, I, so I just always thought of my dad that way. And, and uh, so, so this is a song, it's a long way of saying that uh, this is a song that I made up uh, from a child's point of view. When I was 20 years old, and, uh, trying to figure out, uh, you know, what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, I was, uh, I knew I wanted to play music. I just didn't know that, uh, I didn't know if it would be possible. So this was a song about, uh, I, I thought to myself, well, why do you have to really pick? Why do you have to decide? Why can't you just be everything you want to be? Uh, and so this is a, uh, a song about being a cowboy out west and being the captain of a great ship all at the same time. <laughs> Set me up on my pony on my boat. 
If I were Lord Rogers, I'd join up this thing, oh, I couldn't bring myself to marry an old dear. They just see me in the burger, we go right into the movies, then we buy a boat and on the sea we'd sail. And if I had a boat, I'd go out on the ocean. If I had a pony, I'd ride him on my boat, and we could all together go out and on the ocean. I set me up on my pony on my boat. But now the mystery master man was smart. He got himself a tonto, his tonto did dirty work. Tonto, he was smarter, and one day said, Kimazabe, kiss my hands up, oh, I'm going out to sea. <laughs> and if I had a boat, I'd go out on the ocean, and if I had a pony, I'd ride him on my boat, and we could all together go out on the ocean. Set me up on my pony on my boat. And if I were like lightning, I wouldn't need no sneakers. Will I come and go? Whenever I would please And I'd scare them by the shade And I'd scare them by the light pole But I would not scare my pony On my boat out on the sea And if I had a boat I'd go out on the ocean And if I had a pony I'd ride him on my boat all together go out on the ocean I set me up on my pony on my boat I set me up on my Thank you, sir. Murph, God bless you. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, when Lewis and Clark left St. Louis and went up to the Missouri, they spent a number of years trying to make it to the Pacific Ocean. And along the way, they saw millions and millions and millions of grazing animals. Some say the numbers just estimating from their scientific expedition, which it was a scientific expedition, about a hundred million buffalo just in the Midwest on up to Washington and even into California and down south and into Texas into Louisiana, and there were buffalo across, across the Mississippi too. Today, people will tell you <clears throat> that cattle are ruining the land and there's too much grazing and we have to run the ranchers out and run the cattle off because they're part of the global warming problem. Actually, I think the hot air of Washington, D.C. is really the global warming problem. I'm not saying, not getting political here, because when was the last time that you heard a president give a speech 
about agricultural policy. In the, first, in the State of the Nation address, I've gone back. The last person to mention agriculture and State of the Nation in depth was Jimmy Carter. Why? Because he was a peanut farmer. He understood the importance of farming and ranching. So if there's too many cattle on the range, why, when Lewis and Clark crossed it, was the grass so high that they had to call it Indian grass? Because Indians could sit on the back of a horse and still be hidden in this tall grass that once covered this prairie. Today, only a small part of it is left in Kansas, in the Flint Hills. We don't need fewer cattle on the land because the buffalo tell us one thing. God created a perfect system. Buffalo and those kind of grazing animals, which include cattle, they're called grazing ungulates. These animals Graze and then they move on. Graze and they move on. Graze and they move on. And they don't come back until the part that they already grazed is starting to grow back. In this perfect system, they were their own fertilizer. The urine and the dung actually fertilized the land and put nitrogen back. And the grass that grew actually sequesters carbon out of the air. Over a hundred years ago, a volcano called Krakatoa exploded and put more carbon into the air than you could ever imagine any of the cars, of all the cars in history, ever put out. And what happened? That carbon was immediately, not gradually, but within five years, completely sequestered out of the air and back into the ground because of healthy grasslands that existed back then. Today, if we run ranchers off their land all over this nation, we don't have enough cattle to create that perfect system that God created. And this is why we have global warming. If there's any global warming, it's because, as all of you know, any gardeners there may know, when a patch of ground is bare, the sun comes down and makes it hot and it reflects it back up into the sky. You have then a greenhouse effect. But if there's cattle, perfectly enough cattle, perfectly grazing that land and leaving behind their own fertilizer, as they go through, the grass will grow and the ground will come back. So I leave you tonight with this statement. If grasslands, which is two thirds of the earth, are the only thing that can save the planet, then that means cowboys and cowgirls are the only people that can save the planet. So our fathers, I wrote this song for our fathers. We were Navy people too. My uncle went down to Omaha Beach at 17 also. After about six months of training, he lied to get in. He lied to get into the military. He didn't lie to get out of it. He lied to get into it. <clears throat> he kept his life, but he would never go see Saving Private Ryan, which is a fantastic movie about that battle. He'd never go to see it because he said, Michael, I already know what happened there, and there's no way anybody could describe what it was like. And I asked my uncle, how, as he described a little bit of it, he wouldn't really describe it to us in 
depth until we became adults. I say, how could you do it? Why did you do it? Did you do it to protect our country's borders? He said, no. You've obviously never heard the military oath. When people take the military oath, they don't swear to defend the borders of the United States. They swear to defend the Constitution of the United States and the ideas behind the Constitution and freedom. That's what they swear. And they'll go anywhere if they can, if they're asked to give aid to people who are suffering from dictatorship. I said, and that's the reason you did it? He said, no, that's not the only reason I did it. He said, I did it for God. My country under God My country under God I stand on my land and its sacred ground I'll not surrender I'll not stand down My country knows no king or queen or crown My country is under God my country under God, my country under God, where slaves were freed and free men trod, where my grandfathers broke the sod, no king or queen shall run roughshod over my country under God and that includes sheiks my country under God my country under God though I be shackled bound and chained and though this ground may be bloodstained, it's here I shall always remain in this country under God. My country under God. My country under God. My life, my liberty, my land, they're gifts to me from God's own hand. And may his commandments always stand on that land in this country under God. My country Thanks, Dad. Thanks, Grandpa. Thanks, Lyle. This man's got to have a chance to get home, and it's also too cold to play one more. And uh, we thank you for the standing ovation, and in some cases, sitting ovation. But uh, we're going to just end it there. Thanks again, Lyle. Thanks again, Big Texan. Thanks again, Amarillo Area Foundation. Thank you, Congressman, for coming and serving your community right here, as well as in Washington.